right, we're so excited to have you with us today. Let's start this again. Good morning, Westridge Church. We're so excited to have every single one of you who are here in this room today. If you're watching online, we want you to know that you are a very special guest. We're glad that you've able to be a part of our service in that way as well. We have a lot of good things planned for our service today. We're going to sing together. We're going to read God's word together. We're going to take communion together. And we are excited to have Paul Richardson here to give us our message for today. That's right. So I want to invite you to stand. And I want to invite you to read with me Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. The words will be on the screen for us today, I believe. And I'd love to have you read along with me. This is, again, Psalm 100. Let's read it. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Church, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have to read your word together. Thank you for the privilege we have to sing your praise. Thank you for your goodness over us. Thank you that we can come into your presence with singing and into your courts with praise. That we can come into your gates again with love and adoration for who you are because we know that you have loved us. And so we sing now and we worship you with love in our hearts for all that you are. We love you today and we thank you this morning in Jesus' name. And all of his church said together, amen. Let's worship, church.
his presence and start a Sunday. Let's just continue to focus on his faithfulness, his goodness. He always keeps his promises. God of Abraham, sing this. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven You'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it won't go to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. me. Come on, remind yourself. Great is your faithfulness. 
What a great lyric to remind our own heart of. I like that. Great is your faithfulness to me, oh God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Thank you for your engaged worship this morning. Well, happy Thanksgiving week, everybody. Many of us will be jumping in cars and driving north, south, east, or west to go and to be with grandma and grandpa and all of the other family kids stuffed into the cars, everything, the dog in the back seat, all of that. And uh, we'll just be overwhelmed for us who are driving long distances with our kids in the car with all the why questions. Why do I have to sit by my sister? Why do I have to wear my shoes? Why do we have to go to grandma and grandpa's house again? Why do I have to say yes, sir, and no ma'am to them? All the why questions. And when Christy and I were young and we had little kids in the car and we would get overwhelmed with all of these why questions, sometimes we would just take the easy route and we would revert to the, the answer, you know? It's just because it's what we do as a family. It's just what we do as a family. When I was thinking about walking us through communion today, I thought for me and for maybe some of you, communion can kind of be just something that we do as a family. And we haven't recently wrestled with the question of why. But the why is so important, isn't it? It certainly was important to Jesus because Jesus took the last meal that he would have with his very best friends, his closest allies on the earth in that upper room on that Passover meal to explain to them what communion was and to remind them that he wanted us to do this together regularly because of how important it was. He took a little bit of the bread and he said, men, this is my body, which is gonna be broken for you. And though you don't fully understand it yet, what will happen is, is the curse of sin is going to be broken in your lives because of my sacrificed body. And then he took some of the wine and he said, my blood is going to be spilled out for you as the perfect sacrifice, the final accepted work of the perfect Lamb of God. And as it's spilled over the mercy seat, the penalty of your sin will be revoked for now and for all of eternity. It's significant. It's important. And so I just want to invite us to be mindful of that as we take communion together. If you came in today and you didn't have an opportunity to get elements, we want to make sure that you have them and that you have the opportunity to take communion with us. So if you raise your hand nice and high, those folks of our guest services team who are here will make sure that you have an opportunity to do that. As we're doing that, if you peel back the top layer of cellophane, on your elements, revealing the wafer that's inside that represents the body of Christ, sacrificed, broken, to remove the curse of sin in our lives. Let's thankfully and prayerfully take together. Jesus, for your broken body given to us. We take this bread in memory of the work that you did for, on our behalf on that rugged cross. And now let's peel back that next layer, revealing the juice, representing the blood of Christ shed for every one of us for the remission of our sin to resolve the conflict, the penalty of sin in our lives. Let's thankfully, thankfully, and prayerfully take together. Scripture said that after they had that blessed meal, that they gathered together and they sang a hymn before they went out. 
So I want to invite you to stand with us, church, and sing with us as we worship again at this moment. Two weeks in a row of Southern Gospel hymns. Some of you all are elevating right now. Like I'm watching you, you're, 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 you've come off the ground. <laughs> Praise God, finally. <laughs> you all may be seated. Oh, so good to have so many of you in the house, all of you in the house today. It's good to have all of you who are watching online right now. Uh, we've got a great, great morning. How many of you are traveling this week? Raise your hand. How many of you have people who are coming to see you this week? All right, Lord bless you. Um, I have two married sons who are going to be in my house for the first time together over this week. I'm so excited about it. Amy had me in, up on the house hanging lights in the dark last night. So we have Saturday was uh, Friday was building, making sure we have two good guest rooms. Yesterday I was upside down hanging lights. Literally, Jason, I was, I was fearful for my life, but we had to get it all done. 
So good, so good. It's Thanksgiving week. I feel like we were just in July and here we are in Thanksgiving, but it's so good to have this week in front of us and there's so much to be thankful for, right? So much to be thankful for. Um, we have Paul Richardson's in the house this morning to speak for us. I'm so excited about that. I'm thankful for that. I miss that guy, but it's good to have you this morning. But also, um, it's gift offering season, and we have been doing this as a tradition here at Westridge. Now, this is our 24th year of doing gifts, gift offerings, and I'm so excited about it. I was thinking about all of the things that we've done over the years with our gift offering. I remember our very first gift offering, we actually brought Paul on staff full time. That was the initiative of our, of, of our gift offering. And it's crazy because this year's gift offering involves you as well. So, um, but we've got, as you know, uh, every year we get to the, the week before Christmas, Christmas Sunday, and then our Christmas Eve services. And we have uh, mangers up here in the front of the auditorium. And for 24 years, the goal has been for us to put Christmas in perspective, to give a gift to the Lord that is larger than any gift that we give to anyone else. That's been our, just our heart over the last 24, 25, going into 25 years. And so each year we have tried to focus on not only our own community, but our country and our world. And as we've been going through the book of Mark, one of the things that we've learned over these last several weeks is that Jesus is all about his kingdom and he's about advancing his kingdom. And so many of these initiatives that we do every year are all about not only advancing his kingdom here in Northwest Atlanta, but all over our country and our world. And so this year, uh, as we've been praying wh uh, where, this, where this gift offering money would go, um, we're going to be focusing, as you know, on our special needs building expansion. And we are so close to, to getting that glassed in and getting heat in there. And the floors are all finished. The walls are up. It's out there. If you want to drive past and just pray over that. So excited about the families that God's going to bring here, as well as the, the commitment that we've made to Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, each year. Each year we're able to send some of our local high schools to FCA camp. And throughout the year, we see hundreds of student athletes put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be their savior through that a great ministry. And then, um, as you know, we have a, we're a church that plants other churches. We've been doing that for 24 years. And uh, we uh, are very specifically involved uh, right now in the city of Boston, which is less than 2% church, less than 2%, I should say, um, evangelical Christian. And then we also work in the city of Detroit. Detroit is such a diverse population with one of the largest Muslim populations in our country, one of the largest Jewish populations in our country, and a city, a city that has been falling apart for years, but on the uprise that desperately needs Jesus. And then also here in Atlanta. And as you well know, we just sent out Dakota and Maggie Adair to Central Texas. We're gonna be sending out Blake and uh, Katie Odgers somewhere. He has, still hasn't told us yet, but we're sending him out somewhere. And then as you know, we are involved very strategically in the nation of Scotland. And uh, we are getting ready to send our own, some of our best out to Scotland, Paul and Angela Richardson and their two boys to Edinburgh, along with um, some other couples that are involved in this initiative. It's gonna be an ongoing long-term initiative for us to be involved in Scotland. So our gift offering money this year is going to go to those things. So excited about it. But also our weekly giving, as you know, uh, we, we, we do this every Sunday and all throughout the week. You can give in uh, three different ways uh, here at Westridge Church. And I'm going to look at the screen so I don't forget. You can give online, you can give on the app, you can give through the mail, and then we'll have buckets at the doors. But let's go ahead and pray right now and ask God to bless as we kick off this gift offering season and uh, as we bless our, ask God to bless our regular giving. Father, we want to give with generous hearts. Lord, this whole reason we give is not because you need it, Lord, because you own everything. It's just to remind us, remind our own hearts, Lord, that you own it all, that it all comes from you, and that we can trust you with it, Lord. It's just our way of putting it back in your hands so you can put it back in our hands, Lord, so we can use it to further your kingdom. And it also helps us every single day to put things in perspective, Lord, that we don't become lovers of money, lovers of stuff, lovers of things. Lord, we keep our hearts focused on you. And Lord, you tell us that where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And so we want to invest in your kingdom today and what you're doing all over our community, country, and world. We love you today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Westridge, would you welcome to the stage the senior pastor, lead pastor. I don't know what you are. Lead pastor? Lead pastor of Take Hold Church of Edinburgh, Scotland, my friend Paul Richardson. 
Lead senior, I don't know what. When you haven't started yet, I don't know what you call yourself. But it's good to be home. And uh, it's good to be with all of you. And um, so grateful for this journey that we're on. It has been a crazy, crazy year full of a lot of growth, a lot of ups and downs, just a lot of blessing. Uh, God just demonstrating himself over and over again. And today, I think if I did the math right, we are 50 days away from getting on a plane and, uh, and heading over. We've sold a house and um, many of our belongings, we're, the, the rest is coming soon. I'm sure we'll put it on Facebook and let you know when to come by the house and rummage through all our things. It'll all be on the front yard and it's not coming back inside. And so, um, but it's an incredible journey and we're just grateful to be on it. And if you want to follow along, it means so much to us that so many of you are following along and, and part of this. You can go to takeholdchurch.com. And I was thinking about our other church planner t- today, uh, Dakota, and Maggie Dakota is presenting in front of a church in Dallas, Texas today, and uh, opportunity for partnership there. And uh, you say, what, what, have you guys, what do you guys do like before you launch? That's what we do. We go from church to church and place to place and uh, raise up new partnerships and, and let people know what God's doing in his kingdom. And uh, as a church planter, God, I can just tell you, God's on the move in Scotland, and we're just trying to join him with what he's doing. And uh, we're so blessed to be a part of it from Dallas, Georgia to the ends of the earth. Amen. But that's not why I called you here. I have the privilege today of being a part of this series. Pastor Brian invited me to speak on a passage that he has spoken on many times over the years. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2. You can turn there in your Bibles if you'd like or open your app. And um, I was praying and asking the Lord, Lord, how can I approach this passage differently because I've heard Brian give this talk many times and and I've got things that he has said ringing my ears and and things that I've learned from listening to him but Lord I want to I want to bring something new lay something fresh on my heart and so as I was praying and asking Lord actually doing a a prayer walk a few weeks ago talking to the Lord about that God said "I, I want you to do this differently I want you to look at this story backwards So we are actually going to go through this story today in reverse. Now, I'm not going to read it backwards to where the sentences don't make sense, okay? But I'm going to take sections of a familiar story, and we're going to look at it in reverse. And I believe God is going to reveal himself in brand new ways in your life today. And I can tell you this, every single one of you, by the time that we are done with this talk today, every single one of you is going to have the opportunity to skip to the end of your life, and decide what you want that to look like. You see, I think when we, by taking this story in reverse, by, by starting at the end, we have the opportunity to see things differently. When you skip to the end of the season that you're in, the circumstance that you're in, you have the opportunity to, to see the outcome and know what it's going to take to get there. When you skip to the end of something, it can give you clarity. In our lives, it can give us clarity to run our race and not somebody else's. And most importantly, if you skip to the end and take into account the long arc of eternity, it can give us greater perspective in the day to day. And I can tell you this, when you skip to the end, you you find once again that Jesus is incredible and he is worth following with your whole life life. So I'm not even going to tell you the story first. Most of you know the story. And for those of you that don't know the story, by the end, it will all make sense. You'll, you'll figure it out as, as we go. But the whole, the whole thing will come together. But let's start in Mark chapter 2, verse 12. And he got up immediately and picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. It's an amazing way to start a story, looking at it in reverse. Because when you look at this story in reverse, you find out that when you skip to the end, people are in awe of God and the work that he has accomplished. This same story is told in the book of Matthew, and it's told in Luke. And I love a word that Luke uses in his telling of the story. He says, what we have seen here is just remarkable. We've seen something remarkable. We've seen something uncommon. We've seen something extraordinary. When you skip to the end of your life, or even just the season that you're in, 
what will you look back and say? And I can promise you, by the way, that the season that you're in will come to an end. Even if your family has lived in the same community for generations, your season will come to an end. Friends will move away. Grandparents and parents, loved ones will pass on into eternity. Your kids will move from elementary to middle to high school and beyond. You'll have different roommates. You'll have different jobs. You know, the average American will have 12 different jobs. For some of you, that's awesome news today. You're like, please come, Lord Jesus. Like, when is this going to be done? But even if you stay in the same job for years and years and years, there'll be new projects, new promotions, new goals will be accomplished. And through it all, through every season, there will be an opportunity to serve the God who authored these moments and make him known and have him be glorified. My friends, a a life that is not striving to make itself known or to build its own legacy, but a life that is striving to make Jesus known will be marked by remarkable moments. It will be marked by the extraordinary. A life that is lived is not I, but Christ will have moments that will amaze you and everyone around you and cause people to glorify God. A life hidden in Christ, the scriptures say, is glorified with him. And that's what I want for my life. And that's what I want for your life. That when people turn around and look back and say, not look at that guy, but they say, look at Jesus. And we praise him and we're in awe of him. I wonder if you skip to the end of this time in school or this job or this relationship, what will people say? What will you say? Will you have trusted God in this season? And how will you have obeyed him or not? See, when you align your motives and your ambitions with the intentions and the mission and the kingdom of God, every season of your life can be, rem- can be marked by remarkable. So let's take the next little section of this story. Ch- uh, verse 10, the last part of verse 10 and into verse 11 says this. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Now the he in this verse is Jesus. Telling it in reverse, I want to let you know, Jesus has already entered into the story, but as we're looking at it this morning, he's entering into the story right here. And he says to a paralytic, a man that has come into the presence of Jesus, not able to walk, Jesus looks at him and says, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. This is just a part of what everyone is marveling at, but a miracle has occurred. He didn't walk in, but because of Jesus, he's walking out and everything changed. Jesus has just brought a season of suffering to an end. Now, I want to give you an applicable way of thinking about this story and this paralyzed man because for some of you if you were to be put in this story you are the paralyzed man or the paralyzed woman let me tell you what I mean a synonym to the word paralyzed is overwhelmed just completely overwhelmed and most everyone in this room can move their arms and legs today, but that doesn't mean that there's not a bunch of people listening to God's word today who aren't paralyzed. And I don't know what caused it. Maybe you caused it. Maybe someone else, but something has you stunted and immobilized. And you've woken up so many days and said, I'm not going to make it. Can I just ask you, when was the first time you said, I'm not going to make it? And how many days have you made it through since then? But some of you would say, you know what? The circumstance is too hard. The moment is too overwhelming. The grief is too much. Or the consequences of my sin or being found out is too overwhelming. How can you get to the end of a season of paralysis? You skip to the end by faith and place yourself in front of Jesus. Let me ask you a question today if you're overwhelmed, if you're stuck, if you're just paralyzed in this season that you're in. What's it going to take to move you out of this? Do you finally need to take the leap and begin to work on the dream that God has put on your heart? Do you need to say you're sorry to someone and authentically 
humble yourself? Do you need to forgive someone? Does, is unforgiveness leaving you stuck? Listen, whatever is going on, recognize Jesus' authority over whatever circumstance you are in and how you got there. John 13 tells us that Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. Throughout all the scriptures, there's a thread of the authority and the sovereignty of God. One of my favorite passages, Psalm 107, the psalmist says it this way. Psalm 107, verse 19, Lord, help. Can I just tell you, leave the scripture on the screen. Can I just tell you, that is a full-grown, mature prayer. If you are stuck, if you are overwhelmed, if you are paralyzed in your circumstances or in your sin today, can I just tell you, that is a full-grown adult prayer. You say, I don't know what to say to God. If you can remember those two words, you are on your way. Lord, help. Help, they cried out in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. The theme of Psalm 107 is that God delivers us from all kinds of troubles. But Jesus has the ability to just say the word and remove trouble or sickness or disease. I use this scripture from Psalm 107 because oftentimes in the Hebrew scriptures, there is some type of visual that you can put alongside the scripture. And, and I love the visual. The, the meaning here is that Jesus, God sends our troubles away, not just sends them away, but he casts them out. He throws them away. But here's the thing. He bids them farewell. The visual here is that he waves goodbye. Some of you, in order to Skip to the end of what you're dealing with today. You need to picture yourself alongside of Jesus, just waving goodbye to the season that you're in. And Jesus is just waving with you. See ya. You don't belong here anymore. Sin, you don't belong here anymore. Suffering, you don't belong here anymore. Sickness, you don't belong here anymore. Listen, pain, you don't belong here anymore. Grief, you don't belong here anymore. Depression, you don't belong here anymore. Do you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? I want you to wave goodbye to your suffering for so long that you got to hold your arm up. And Jesus is not going to have to hold his arm up. He's going to be sitting there going, all right, you're fine. But just keep waving. Just keep waving goodbye to the season that you're in and remind yourself who's in charge of that season. You're under the authority of Jesus, and you can live in victory throughout those troubled, distressful moments if you will put yourself at his side and just wave goodbye. Listen, we live in a sin-soaked, disease-filled world, and there are a lot of awful things we cannot explain. But I can tell you, every single one of those things is under the authority of Jesus, and by his authority and by his stripes we're healed, he can deliver us from all of it. And according to the psalm, not just healing from destruction, but he also delivers from distress or anguish. In other words, he can deliver you from what happened to you, and he can deliver from when you happened to you. And if he doesn't deliver you from it, my friends, he'll deliver you through it. If he doesn't deliver you from it, he will deliver you through it. And if he allows you to stay in something because his ways are higher and there is something larger at work, you can be assured he is still working all things together for your good and for his glory. So let's keep moving through the story. It's kind of fun to go backwards, isn't it? Verse 5 through 9 of this story says this. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. There are two miracles that occur in these five verses. The first is that this man receives forgiveness of sin from Jesus. So he's been brought in, he's laying there paralyzed, but his physical condition is not the most important thing. Jesus skips over the physical and goes right to the spiritual. And I told you at the outset that every single one of you would get the opportunity today to, to skip to the end of your life. And even not knowing the circumstance that you're in, I can tell you that when you skip to the end 
Every single one of us is going to step into eternity and be faced with the question, what did you do about Jesus? And if you are not a believer today, you're just here listening, just checking it out, you're watching online, can I, can I just ask, do you realize that Jesus is the issue? Jesus is the issue. Salvation is through him. That's why he's able to give it to this man. The issue of eternal salvation does not rest on good works. And I know if you've been in church for a while, if you've been in this church for a while, it seems so obvious. But can I just remind us today that most people in the world believe that when you skip to the end of your life, you will be weighed and measured on whether or not you are good enough. That's not what the Bible teaches. There are not enough rules or laws to justify you. And can I tell you, there are not enough rules or laws to justify you, including the ones in this book. That's not how you get there because they would have been have to be kept perfectly and no one can do that. My friends, my brothers and sisters who maybe someone comes across this who's Jewish today. Can I just tell you, you can't keep all 613 perfectly. And now the, the Jews have done something that they would say is building a fence around the Torah. In other words, they've made more laws and more laws and more laws. And every time you make a new law, every time you make a new rule, every time you make a new preference, you just realize how much more difficult it's going to be to be perfect. You just realize how much more you have fallen short. You make yourself more miserable because you can't rise up to even your own standards and preferences. And it's amazing that we still do this, not just in, in Jewish circles, but this happens in Christian evangelical circles. We can't rise up to the standards of our own preferences, which are, which are why some of the most miserable people are walking around in churches today because they've added to this law and people are looking at them going, what's your deal? I thought Jesus came to set you free and he did, but we decided to add some stuff that we thought would be good. And it's robbing the joy of the church and generations are coming along behind us now. And there, there's this thing that, that is said on blogs and websites and all this stuff. The younger generations are deconstructing the gospel. No, they're not. The gospel is still, it still stands. Jesus has paid it all. He is still risen today. You know what they're deconstructing? They're deconstructing the church. And we need to stand up and say, you know what? We're sorry for all that we added to this book because all you need is Jesus. Jesus paid it all. Jesus is risen. Salvation is only through him and not everything else we make up. My friends today that are in Catholic churches, I've poked fun of you a time or two up here over the last couple decades, and I'm sort of sorry. <laughs> We've actually had emails sent to Westridge before because of things I've said. And I got to tell you, it's just because we're jealous of Notre Dame football and they have the NBC contract, and we just don't think they should. That's all it is. <laughs> it should go to the Bulldogs so that it's always on prime time, and we'll just deal with it from there, all right? Amen. That's the first amen that guy has said in months and months. <laughs> Was that you, Dale? <laughs> but can I tell you, my Catholic friends, I know there are a lot of people that come to churches like Westridge. Maybe you were raised in, in the Catholic church. And the same thing is true for you. All of these extra rules were created. All of this standing up and sitting down and saying the right thing at the right time, and then confession, because everybody knows you can't do it perfectly. Everybody knows that you are going to mess up. Can I just tell you that all the extra man-made things we have added are not going to bring salvation. I want to put in clear focus today that salvation comes by faith in Jesus alone. Romans chapter 3 says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction in any of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation for it by his blood to be received by faith. We just took communion in this room a few moments ago, reminding ourselves that it's the blood of Jesus that gives us the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is the requirement, friends, to enter into heaven. And the righteousness of God comes by faith in Jesus alone. It's the requirement for every man and woman on the planet, but it's been made possible by what the scriptures call the kind intentions of God. 
listening to my voice today, I, I'm, I'm begging you whenever you watch this on demand later, if you're in the room, you're watching live, whatever it may be, would you please skip to the end of your life for just a moment and know that the only way to end this life in the presence of God and in heaven is to believe that Jesus died as your sacrifice and rose from the dead so that you could have eternal life. It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor, if you are in perfect health or sick. It doesn't matter if your good outweighs your bad. It doesn't matter if your bad outweighs your good. The only thing that matters is whether or not you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Oh, if you haven't done that yet, I, I hope that that just keeps ringing around and spinning in your head over these next few moments. Holy Spirit of God, draw them. Draw them to yourself. We're going to give you an opportunity at the end of this talk to put your faith and trust in Jesus today. As some more application, there's, there's another miracle in this story. Jesus does a Jedi mind trick. He does a little mind reading. It's amazing. The leaders, the religious leaders who are sitting around and believing in law and, and good works, they are offended that Jesus has just given salvation to this man. They're, they're offended. Only Jesus can do this. And sometimes, you know, when you're in a conversation with somebody, you can read body language, you can read someone's facial expression, but only Jesus knows their hearts. And Jesus knows our hearts today. And he's sitting there. They're not saying anything out loud. They're not protesting out loud. The scriptures say they are reasoning in their hearts. And Jesus responds because he knows what's in their hearts just as surely as he knows what's in yours and mine. And today Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, sovereign over all things. He knows and sees it all. So my friends, whatever room you are in, whenever you are in it, he sees that. Now this is not some sort of gotcha. This is a loving God who cares as much for these religious people as he does for this paralyzed man. But as I go in reverse in this story, it causes me to ask the question, who are you when you think nobody's looking? Is there something in hiding? Is there something that you may as well confess to him because he already knows about it? Even with consequences, his response is going to be loving and gentle and kind. It's worth asking the question today, what does Jesus find in your thought life? The words that people use certainly make an impact, but ultimately it's your thought life that's going to demonstrate itself in your physical life. Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, and he says this, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the, of the heart his mouth speaks. When you skip to the end of what you say, it is a result of a storehouse of thought. And I pulled this from Luke chapter 6 because this is a fascinating little verse. Jesus calls all of our thoughts treasures. And you either have good treasure or you have evil treasure. Now, I don't want to go too far down into fiction with this, but it occurs to me that whenever I'm watching a story, reading a story or watching a movie, and there's evil treasure involved in the story, the only way it can be enjoyed is if you stay in the place where it was kept or buried. Have you noticed that? That's a perfect description of what evil thoughts do. They leave you trapped and isolated. Lust, pornography, addiction, those things, that, those things have you trapped and isolated, and Satan would love nothing more. What about worry? What about anxiety? What about depression? Can I just ask the question, when, when you skip to the end of your train of thoughts, are they leading you to where you want to go? Colossians chapter 3 begins by saying, seek the things of heaven, set your mind on things that are above. And then the apostle Paul writes this. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. I love that about the apostle Paul, by the way, you can leave the scripture up. I love that. It's like he just, he says so many things redundantly that like the high school grammar teacher would have just ripped him apart for because he just wants to remind you as he's saying this. God's chosen ones, that's you. If you put your faith in Christ, you can raise your hand to that one. Holy and beloved, that's you too, by the way. He says, put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, with, with, with one another. and if one has a complaint against the other, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
We must continually create new treasures of thought. Treasure up thoughts to remind yourself you are loved and chosen and beloved by God. Treasure up thoughts to remind yourself to be kind and to be humble. Use your influence to enlarge and honor others and not diminish them. Bear one another's flaws because none of us are perfect. Forgive those who talk bad about you or to you because you have been forgiven. Don't let any root of bitterness take hold in your life. Listen, it doesn't happen without a high degree of intentionality. But when you continually create a treasure of heaven-directed thoughts in abundance, you find yourself reflecting the character and nature of God. All right, so in reverse, here's the last portion of the story. Mark 2, verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum, this is Jesus, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So now we can put the whole story together. Treat it like a Christopher Nolan movie if you have to and go back and just listen to the whole thing over again. But picture this in your mind now. Here's, here's how it begins, all right? Through Mark, Peter recounts this story that even early on in his public ministry, the crowds grew quickly. In fact, that's how chapter one really ends. It says, for, for the most part, Jesus would be outside in open spaces. And even in open spaces, people would still gather around. Crowds would still gather around. But in his adult ministry days, Jesus has some sort of home in Capernaum. Probably not a home that he bought. Maybe it's with Peter's family or wherever it might be. But when it comes to Capernaum, that was home base. And this says he was at home. Everybody knew where it was. These homes were often very small, multiple family members, maybe a courtyard, maybe a gate, whatever it was, but people had crowded into this area. Most of these homes had some type of exterior staircase which would allow you to get up on the roof, which comes in very handy in this story. So it's likely that when Jesus woke up on this day in Capernaum, that there, were already, there was already a crowd outside of his home. They had already filled the courtyard. They had already come all alongside. The gate was already blocked. Who knows how deep the crowd was, but it was a huge crowd, and all he's trying to do is spend a couple days at home. But now let's go back to our paralyzed friend who just a moment, who would probably prefer I was telling this story in order because right now he's, he's paralyzed again. But he's being brought in by, by four men, four friends, we don't know how he was paralyzed. Matthew and Luke both tell this story. We don't know if he was paralyzed from birth or if it was a terrible accident. I tend to think it's the latter, that something awful has happened. When Jesus calls him son, in a portion that we've already read, when he says, son, your sins are forgiven, the term that Jesus uses is a term that you would use with like a teenager or a young adult. And I bring this up because it changes the story for me. I was raised on flannel graph like some of you. And in flannel graph, this guy is already pretty old and he's being carried in by a bunch of old friends. And I can just tell you, these could be five young adults who were just out goofing off and had some sort of accident. They could have had a boating accident on the Sea of Galilee. They, they could have gone rock climbing in Caesarea Philippi. They could have been doing something on the Jordan River and just something awful happened. Maybe it was something awful that they were all there present for. But what we know for sure is that these men had such a bond. They cared enough for their friend that they were going to get their friend to Jesus no matter what. And it gives me this thought, the kingdom of heaven is experienced by people who are not discouraged by the crowd. The kingdom of heaven is experienced by people who are not discouraged, not influenced, not deterred by the crowd. When the crowd is in your way of getting to Jesus, you go through them or you go around them or you go over them. 
and you just bring him in through the roof. I mean, this crowd has got to be full of all kinds of people, believers, honest seekers, haters, doubters, religious leaders, people with evil thoughts. There's a lot of examining and kicking things around going on in this crowd. If you Listen, if you need to ponder your circumstance a little further, then you go ahead and do that. But if you, need a, if you need a moment to think and consider, then you do that. But once you know what you have been called to do and the purpose of God is in your heart, let no discouragement or obstacle or group stop you from getting all the way to Jesus. Who knows? Listen, who knows what they had tried before this moment? He's obviously a close friend. They probably didn't carry him around everywhere, but... These guys are having a hard time doing life without their friend. And so as often as they can, they, they, they bring him along. They have probably tried some ancient medicines. There's, they've probably tried some physical therapy, some, some deep tissue massage. They've probably tried a lot of things. They've done everything they know to do. We will not turn around. We will not turn back until we've done all we can. And when you skip to the end of everything you can do, that's when you discover what Jesus can do. Don't make Jesus the last result. Skip to the end and put every circumstance and your whole life in his hands from the very beginning. Exasperated, overwhelmed, stuck, paralyzed. Don't just wait it out. God has placed this in your hands, this moment in your hands, and use this moment of faith to put everything that you've got in front of Jesus. Put your relationships, your work, your finances, your health, whatever it is that you're going through over and over again in the hands of Jesus, and over and over again, he will give you the next immediate step. I love how Eugene Peterson describes the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Matthew 5, 3, he says this, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. Come on. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With, with less of you, there is more of God in his rule. With less of you, there's more of God in his rule. Let his motives override your motivation. Let his plans override your intentions. Seek his thoughts over your thoughts. Skip to the end. How do you skip to the end? You begin every day by saying, God, this day is yours. This day is yours. You ask that his Holy Spirit give you wisdom and guidance over every decision, great or small. You begin and end your day with prayer and you bathe every thought and action in between with prayer. You diligently seek him in the middle of the massive and the mundane. You skip to the end of every season and picture him being praised and getting glory for every circumstance. And you try to make yourself part of that and you try to make your life worthy of that aim. Jesus gives a teaching that Matthew records in Matthew 25. It's a teaching about what it looks like to skip to the end of your life. He describes a separation of those who don't believe in him you're cast into eternal darkness and separation, eternal fire. And he also describes a reckoning for those who have believed in him. And right in the middle of the teaching, he tells a story. He tells a story of three different people and how they used their lives. Two of them faithfully used all that had been entrusted to them for the expansion of the work of the kingdom of God. One had been given more than the other, but they each one faithfully used what they had. And in Matthew 25, 21, here's what they hear at the end of the story. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Whew. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Let it be. Enter into the joy of your master. No competition, no comparison, 
They stayed in their own lane, each of them standing before the master, giving account for how they used their own lives. And I'm telling the story, in the story, Jesus reveals the goal for each of us in our own lives, what we want to hear him say at the end. When you skip to the end of your life, what do you want to hear him say? Do you? Do you? Well done. I don't know your season. I don't know your circumstance. I don't know if you have a lot or a little. What I do know is that when you skip to the end of your life, you have the opportunity to hear him say those same words to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Can I caution you? There was another who took what they had and they buried it and they didn't use it. Didn't lose anything, but they didn't gain anything for the kingdom of God. You will not hear well done if you try to sneak in. You won't hear well done if you go in somehow incognito. He says well done, not thanks for your opinion, not well thought, Hear him say, you served me. You recognized my authority and gave all that you had in light of the love and salvation that's been provided. Well done. If you consider this day and every day with the future and the long arc of eternity in your mind's eye, It will clarify your present. Skip to the end. Would you bow your head with me? So we set aside this time, this moment of response. I know it happens most every week, but I want to remind you what this is. This is a moment of response. We're going to respond in worship for just a moment, but I want to invite you to respond in your seat. This isn't the time to think about the the transition to going to getting the kids or what are we finally going to do for the rest of the day? What are we going to eat? This is, how am I going to respond to what God's word has just said? You're responding to him. You're not responding to me. And I wonder if in the season and circumstance that you're in, is this an opportunity for you to recognize his authority? Do you need to trust him today and wave goodbye to the suffering that he has overcome? I know some of you, he has not delivered you from it, he, but he is there with you through it. Would you preach that to the, your own heart today? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to remind you of that? Would you keep walking in faith and not throw in the towel? Keep going a little further, make it through another day and then the next and then the next and then the next. Is that train of thought leading you to where you wanna go? Is there anything in hiding? Let's bring it out to a loving and gentle and forgiving Savior right now. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you're thinking that if you skip to the end, you're just hoping the good outweighs the bad, can I just tell you, for most of us, it's not gonna be the case. Whether the good outweighs the bad or the bad outweighs the good, the only way to enter into eternal life is to put your faith and trust in Jesus whose blood paid for our sins, for our mistakes, and he's risen from the dead that we can live forevermore with him. If you need to put your faith and trust in him, would you just listen to me right now and just do that right where you are at home or in a seat in this room or watching later on? Would you just right now in your own words, pray to God, say, God, I put my faith and trust in Jesus. I confess that I believe that he died for me so that I could have a relationship with him. And I confess, I believe that he has risen again. He's risen from the dead so that I might have eternal life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if anybody prayed to receive salvation today, would you just slip up your hand big enough so I can see it? Is there anybody in the room, even in the nine o'clock service that might've done that? Watching online, you can let us know 
Jason will let us know again at the end of the service what you can do. We want to invite you, if that's you today, even if you're wrestling with it in this moment, to go back to just a glass atrium, the back left-hand part, my left, of this room and speak with some of the Westridge staff. But we want to respond in this moment with worship with a song that God laid on Jason's heart with this whole idea of what it looks like to skip to the end. What do we want to hear? What do we want that moment to be like? God, would you encourage and galvanize our hearts to walk with you every single day in response to this word? Thank you. Thank you for all you do for us and that when we skip to the end, you're there and you're there every moment along the way. In Jesus' name.
church to skip to the end and know where we're going to spend eternity. It spurs you on. It gives you perspective to remember, remember who we're living for. Amen. So glad you came to worship with us today. May we continue to walk out that faith, believing that when we skip to the end, we know who has the victory. We know who's walking us through the season we're in. We know who's going to deliver us. So glad you came to worship with us this week. We pray you have a happy Thanksgiving, safe travels for everybody who's traveling. And church, we cannot wait to celebrate with you again next Sunday. You're loved.